Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. In this episode, we have a long interview about dinosaur character design in films with paleo sculptor and Marvel film storyboard artist David Krentz. Hello and welcome back to Terrible Lizards. Back. I don't know where you've been, but we've been here waiting for you. Um, because last week we were talking about, well, old films, weren't we, Dave? Your speciality, the old thing. Yes, because I'm so, I'm so old and decrepit. <laughs> It's, it's what you're interested in. In general, you pick the oldest things. You don't pick modern things. You don't even pick woolly mammoths. You pick old things. <laughs> but yeah, we were talking about the old films. What really surprised me last week was you saying, Ray Harryhausen, his films to Jurassic Park, the equivalent of Jurassic Park to Jurassic World, or whatever we are on now. Yeah, and pretty that much. Just, that's just made me go, what? We should be so much better at doing the sort of more modern movies, maybe, because Jurassic World is a bit... It's a bit meh. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's hard to find a lot of critics who've been extremely excited by it. No, I mean, it's the running away in heels. That was the world, wasn't it? Yeah. I think, yeah, from the T-Rex and the the made-up dinosaurs. I mean, it's not the only problem. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, on, on the one on the one hand, you, you know, you get lots of nitpicking of films, and I try not to do that too much last week. And you're always going to have some compromises in storytelling, and they explained it somewhere, and then that line got cut out, or that people didn't hear it or misinterpret it or whatever. But they do have some weird stuff in those films. I mean, the, the, the made up dinosaur, I think, is the is the simple greatest example because their justification for doing it is that basically, well, people aren't that excited anymore about the fact that we literally have a theme park with literal living dinosaurs dinosaurs in it despite the fact that at one point they say there's 20,000 people on the island or something and it's like yeah because you know zoos after they had giraffes you know two or three years <laughs> after they'd opened people stopped going because they'd seen <laughs> giraffes before so we had to start putting giraffe heads on elephants to, otherwise no one would show up <laughs> just to be fair I'd definitely visit that zoo they did right that. but it's <laughs> But yeah, their the justification for the fictional dinosaurs is that people were bored of the fact that you could literally go and see a live T-Rex. <laughs> One of the things that they made up in that thing about their made-up dinosaurs, which I do want to kind of ask you about before we get to, because this is going to be an extended guest episode, because we've yes. got a very cool guest on. But one thing I wanted to ask you about that was this idea of changing colour in skin. Because we know that chameleons can do it. We know that cuttlefish and certain octopuses, mm. and they can change their texture well, all, too. Well, all the cephalopods. Yeah, oh, sorry, in terms of colour, yeah. But in terms of, I mean, what, is there any, there's, there might, can't be any evidence that happened in dinosaurs or direct like evidence no but we've like very recently in the last two years got some ancillary evidence that you could use to infer it so it's Ooh. worth saying that chameleons don't change their color in anything like the way that most people think they do you could sit them down for ages in front of a towel and they might get a splodge on them that's a bit like it. Well, right. So so first of all, people think that their big colour change is for camouflage and it's not. It's communication, man. Yeah. The, yeah. The main reason they change colour is fights with other chameleons and they're either showing <laughs> off to girlies or telling other males to get stuffed. Same reason we change colour yes. as well. <laughs> their, their, their background colour is a camouflage colour, but the idea that they go through all these different patterns to hide in different environments it just isn't true at all. So that's the first thing. And secondly, it's really slow. Um, it, it's a hormonal thing, so it actually takes quite a while to get going. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Give me five minutes. Hang yeah, on. and it, it's right, and it's it's not that complicated, and it doesn't produce anything like the details or all the different colours. So again, pe- there are loads of fake videos of chameleons going. You know, someone holding them up to a background and just moving cards, and the chameleon goes red and blue and pink, and it's like, no, it would take about ten minutes, and it can't make any of those colours. So it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that at all. Now there are there are loads of lizards, and I think only a couple of snakes that can change their colour a bit. So they're quite good at becoming lighter or darker, depending on quite how light or dark it is, so they can respond, which will change like them those and make them colour variant um, sunglasses. A bit like that, yeah. Um, and some have photoreceptive skin, so if you shine light on their skin, it will change colour. But again, a certain degree. Do you know what I tan? 
so well. Some of them can flush bits that they're trying to show off relatively Ooh. bright colours. But the, this is, I guess it's more about changing shade. They're not usually going from green to brown. They're more green like getting and embarrassed. Making that green enhanced or toning it down. <laughs> right. So that's really quite common in lizards. As far as we know, it's basically absent in birds. They can flush some stuff, but it's usually just blood rather than the, the colours or, or anything like that. And they can do things like laying down brighter colours during the breeding season and, and take it back. But again, not, not really the kind of thing we're talking about. And that's about. feathers, not really. Well, but, but even, in, even in bits of skin or bits of beak. Ah. But again, it's not really the, the same thing. And then crocodiles didn't appear to be able to change colour at all. And the key word in that sentence is didn't, because it's recently been discovered that so there was, this was uh, it's probably true of more groups but it's only been I think tested on this one where it was discovered I it, I want to say it was the New Guinean crocodile it was one of the one there's a whole bunch of different species in Indonesia New Guinean and Philippines and others one of those um, basically showed that the young do actually get brighter and darker according to ambient light levels oh. and this then of course is extremely leading because we have that bracketing thing and you know if crocodiles can't do it and birds can't do it well maybe dinosaurs could change color but it's hard to argue when none of their relatives appear capable of doing that but now one side of that is actually a yeah they can do it some can do it a little bit and that really kind of opens up rather more the idea that some dinosaurs could probably do again not not even modern chameleon like let alone fake what people think chameleons do but the idea that even something like stegosaurus might get rather rather brighter when it's one of shows off and rather darker at night when it wants to be a bit more hidden is m- way more plausible. That's cool. So that that's just one of the examples of things that might be look bad in a movie, but actually is pretty bad in that movie. I'm not even going to pretend. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend that it was a good... <laughs> But well, it's again, a nice it's, idea it's, to chat about. Mm. And well, I'll, I'll tell you what, Dave, I'll let you introduce our guest because you're the ones who, like, you managed to get him on because I didn't. I wasn't yeah. friends with him already, but you <laughs> yeah. were. Izzy is, is knows all the famous people and Dave knows some dinosaur nuts. <laughs> it's, uh... Basically, although I didn't know his name, I knew of his work. So, you know, yeah. that's real fame, isn't it? Yeah, that's probably true. So today we've got David Krentz, who di- people who are into their dinosaurs will know. I love. Because... He makes some beautiful sculptures and 3D models and, and things which are which are available online. Um, I mean, absolutely stunning stuff. But as an artist, or at least in outside of dinosaurs, he's probably far better known for the fact that he's a storyboard artist and has done, you know, little movies like The Avengers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and most of the Marvel stuff, he's one of the lead storyboard artists. I think I've heard of a few of them. Yeah. And has written and directed a bunch of dinosaur-centric TV shows that then got edited in to a movie so at least some people including in the UK because I saw it in the cinema have been to the cinema and seen Dinotasia which was a dinosaur documentary written produced and directed and all animal designs and animated by David Krentz Um, so yeah he's an ideal person to talk about depictions of dinosaurs both in movies and on TV and how we recreate them David Krentz now obviously you are oh no I say obviously but this might not be a thing you might actually hate dinosaurs and your career is a terrible one because you completely dislike them so what is your relationship with dinosaurs when did your love of dinosaurs start do you think well you know like most kids it was like it was really young and i think it was seeing the zallinger mural in a in a book and i was just fascinated with it and i still have that book and i drew all over that mural and all the margins of that book trying to copy those dinosaurs and it just captured my, you know, imagination. And, uh, you know, I grew up in, in Winnipeg, Manitoba in Canada. And we didn't have a lot of cool stuff at the museum for dinosaurs. <laughs> it was, it was pretty sad. So I wasn't, I didn't like have to walk into the museum and see the giant skeleton and be, whoa, blown away moment. You know, it was all through books and things. And, um, you know, I, I've had so many interests in my life, but I always keep coming back to dinosaurs. It, it's it was my first love. Yeah, and I was I was just that that weird dinosaur kid. Oh, and I have to say, everything everything in my life, every skill I've acquired or interest I've had has somehow come out of my love for dinosaurs. You know, and that's what I always tell parents when they say, "Well, my kids into dinosaurs." I'm like, good, because that's the gateway drug to many sciences. 
to history, to a lot of things. The gateway thing is, is really true, because I mean, I, I'd always suspected that, but it was only when I was writing online and I would periodically get comments, and particularly I did a blog years ago for The Guardian, and it was a, like, w- what use is paleontology? Because we're going through the usual round of funding cuts, and it's like, well, we're giving the engineers money, and we're giving the medics money, but, you know, art history and paleontology, and the, these are further down the list. And that was, you know, one of the points I made is that actually, you know, these in, these are engaging subjects, and it's useful to get people engaged. And I've always felt that was true, but I never really had any evidence for it. And it was really nice to see a bunch of comments from people going, oh, yeah, uh, including what? It's like uh, he was like an engineer for the European Space Agency and had built one of our satellites and went, I wouldn't have done this if it wasn't for dinosaurs that got me into science, which got me into physics, which got me into engineering. And now I am literally a rocket scientist. (sighs) I'd be like, excellent. It really does happen. (laughs) Yeah, I know. If I pointed my camera that way, you would see Caltech. I constantly see scientists and people around here, you know, as well. And you get talking in coffee shops. And I mean, these are all, you know, <laughs> people who <laughs> do things with nuclear or something or other, you know, and, and they all, you know, you, you get on the subject of dinosaurs and they all, they all have a fascination for them as well. You know, it's just, that's the cool thing about science is they're all so linked and, and, uh, yeah. Well, you're on you're on a current call with a dinosaur expert. Yeah, him. <laughs> no shit. So, is there anything that's always that you've never quite understood? Is there anything you'd like to ask Dave about? If you had an ultimate dinosaur question, really, what would it be? Okay, I got one. Is it Diplodocus or Diplodocus? Ooh, <laughs> lovely. Personally, I, I'm going to go as a non-scientist here. It's definitely Diplodocus because it sounds like more like you know it's Diplodocus. It's quite whereas Diplodocus, Diplodocus sounds like a Roman soldier. <laughs> <laughs> no, Diplodocus sounds like it's it's a little more prancing, and a Diplo Diplo it, then he's just lumbering. You know, Diplodocus is lumbering. Diplodocus is a little more lighter on his feet, I think. So, yeah, no, uh, he's clumsy though. It's like Diplodocus. He's falling down the stairs. Diplodocus, Diplodocus. Yeah. In a desperate attempt to get back on topic, um, so I, I think for the, for that one at least, there's a. It's one of the few I think where there's a really kind of fundamental split. I mean, there's a. Most people pronounce everything the same way. I don't think anyone pronounces Tyrannosaurus different or Stegosaurus different. Um, my yeah. understanding. Understanding yeah. is that this is one of the relatively rare ones where there's a real split along the Atlantic, and it's largely the Brits who say Diplodocus, and it's largely the Americans or North Americans who say Diplodocus. Um, but I don't think I think um, both are technically correct. There is no one true pronunciation for this. When people publish papers that describe new taxa uh, a new species. Often now they'll include, um, so you have to include an etymology section to say what the origin of the name is. But often people now will also include a pronunciation guide as well. Um, but that's a fairly recent thing. I've, I've done it in a couple of my papers, but it, it doesn't always happen. I wonder if that has to do with uh, many Chinese dinosaurs, you know, dinosaurs coming out of China and, and a lot of X's and yeah. J's that we are used to in the West. <laughs> Well, I think it's at least in part because people were using more and more native languages of various different types, uh, which included lots of weird vowel combinations. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so through people. So I think it's, um, I'm, I'm probably going to get the exact details of this wrong, but there's this weird little sauropod from Argentina called Brachytraclea pan. <gasps> um, and the, the lead author of that was Ollie Rauhut. At least a couple of listeners may, may know of Ollie. So Ollie's a German researcher, but he did his PhD in the UK and then he spent several years in, in South America. So he's basically natively fluent in English, Spanish and German. And he told me that he designed that name so that you can only really say it properly <laughs> if you can do the vowel sounds of all three languages. So the idea being it was basically only him who could say it right. And what's funny is that probably only six-year-olds can pronounce it correctly. So <laughs> Say it again, Dave. Say it again. I have it in my head as Brachytraclea pan, but I suspect Brachytraclea pan. I'm not quite getting it right. That sounds like ancient brain surgery. That's what that sounds like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Traf- traffening. That's well, right. <laughs> exactly. The worst one is, which I will I will deliberately pronounce incorrectly because almost no one can do it correctly. Is Inguebisaurus from down in uh, I can't remember if it's South Africa or Namibia or Lesotho, but it, it's one of those very southern countries. And the the formal correct pronunciation of that name has the Joja language, assuming I'm saying that nation correctly, who are the people who use right. clicks and tongue clicks and whistles as part of their language. <laughs> and then Gwebisaurus <laughs> technically has a yeah, in the middle a of it. It's Gwebisaurus, yeah. <laughs> Gwebisaurus. Yeah. Oh my god. That's fantastic. <laughs> but everyone just calls it Gwebisaurus. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, what's, what's a, I, you know, back to my comment about, you know, maybe a six year old would know it. You know, what I've noticed is uh, when kids master these names, there's just such, they, they, they possess a power suddenly over adults. Yeah. You know, how many times have you seen an adult trying to pronounce parasaurolophus? Yeah. You know, and they just give up and then the kid goes, it's parasaurolophus. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly the whole room, the oxygen gets sucked out and they all stare at this kid like, whoa, you know, and there's a power to that, you know, and I, I remember feeling that power as a kid too. Just the other day, I got a text from someone saying, oh, my nephew wants to know about what I worked out was Acrocanthosaurus from the text, but it was it was a desperate attempt at a phonetic spelling of clearly, and they had no idea what the hell this. And it's ac- Acranthosaurus. Yeah. Acrocanthosaurus. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's probably what it was. And yeah, it's like this is a five year old who's demanding knowledge yeah. from the paleontologist, and the, the parents yeah. like it's it's this, I think. <laughs> well, when I asked you, uh, the reason I asked you Diplodocus or Diplodocus is because the first time I met. A real paleontologist face to face was uh, uh, Stuart Sunita, mm. and I was, you know, I was on the Disney movie, so I was already, you know, in my twenties, and I'd never <laughs> met one or spoken many of these names out loud. I've always just read them, and so, and I was talking to him, and, and I said, "But is it the same as?" And then I'm like, "Oh my god, I've got to say it. Is he going to like <laughs> scold me? You know?" I said. Diplodocus, and then you know he had the smile on his face, like, well, it could be, you know. <laughs> That's very cute. That was, so, what, what you were working <laughs> working on a movie for Disney then, or what were you doing? Yeah, it's called Disney's uh, Disney's Dinosaur. It came out in two thousand or ninety nine or something like that. Yeah, I was the lead character designer on that film. Oh, wow. So that's the one with the Iguanodon Tid, who's raised by mammals. Raised by lemurs, yeah, yes. That's the one. Um, yes, I, I, I was the first person to put lips on dinosaurs. <laughs> wow. Because um, <laughs> otherwise they can't talk. <laughs> yeah. And make, and make kissy faces. Yes, that was, <laughs> that was a dark day when I had to relinquish that. I fought for beaks for so long. I I really like that, actually. That, that I think, is one of the kind of underrated ones. Um, I think it kind of largely slid Hmm. through the net, but it it looks really good. For for the time. Yeah, but it's it's also lovely that it's not full of obvious animals. It's Iguanodontians and Carnotaurus and Abelisaurs is his favourite. Yeah. And, and like, it's not just, oh, look, it's T-Rex and Triceratops, which is... Yeah, you know what you kind of expect, and so it's really yeah. great to see different animals and done well. The 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 Carnotaurus, I think, is great in that. Really good. That's right. I spent most of my time on the Carnotaurus. I mean, uh, I did a lot of like backseat modeling uh, with the <laughs> digital modelers. You know, I would, this is back in the days where you CV modeling, where you move one point at a time oh, to create a curve. It was unbelievable, but. But I would sit behind them in the backseat driving, like, higher, lower, to the side, this, that, but, you know. But then I had to go off and do my other duties, but there are many times I snuck back because the Carnotaurus was being built <laughs> and spent hours and hours trying to get that right because I knew that's the moneymaker. Yeah. The guy with the teeth is always the moneymaker. No one's watching this movie for the Iguanodons. Yeah. They want to see the Carnotaurus. That's what's going to sell toys. I, well, I was going to say, I, I had, it, all throughout my PhD, uh, I had an inflatable Carnotaurus in my uh, in my office that was <laughs> sold off cheap from the Disney store yes. in town. So there, there, was a, there, was a, there was an inflatable Carnotaurus hanging from the roof of my PhD office. Oh, really? It was, it was your wow. design. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, that just, I mean, look, it, you know, these things get away from you. You just, I always started off trying to be as accurate as I could. 
and I knew it would drift. It would go different directions yeah. as as producers and money people, and everyone had their input. But that one took on a, a life of its own. I mean, the head got wider, that uh, spiny lizard tail, all these mm-hmm. other things. But but it came out pretty cool, yeah. you know. Um, well, the one thing that really surprised me is that it didn't end up with really vertical or really curved horns, which would be the obvious thing to end up doing to it and it still has yeah. the kind of flattened look we should should say because most of our listeners are not nerds this podcast is supposed to be for the more general person of interest <laughs> okay. rather than hyper dinosaurs so we have talked about abelisaurs before <laughs> they're the kind of south american dinosaurs with really tiny arms even smaller than tyrannosaurs yeah carnotaurus yeah. is probably the most famous of these and it's it name literally means carnivorous bull because it has yeah. a pair of horns on the top of its head. And these are mostly illustrated as sticking kind of straight up and pointing forward a little bit, like a cow's horns. And actually, mm-hmm. they're A, kind of flat and kind of elliptical in cross-section rather than circular. And B, they basically point out sideways, left and right, rather than up and forward. And and that is, the, A, something that everyone gets wrong anyway. And B, if you're the producer or director of a movie and you want to make your animal look more distinctive, is the obvious thing to change. And yeah. so it's to great credit that that didn't happen, even yeah. if other bits of it ended up a bit weird. I suppose from an animation perspective, Having such weird horns would actually be really useful because I think part of character design is you want to make a really unusual silhouette before anything. Absolutely. And then you can build out from that. Yeah. So well, I, I'm really interested in the way that you go about your character design and where you fo- where you place that focus and how that works. But it's particularly when you're looking at something where nerds like Dave are going to go, well, that's wrong the moment he sees it anyway mm. and how you balance mm-hmm. that. Well, I would... Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll cite two movies I was character designer on. One is the Walking with Dinosaurs 3D movie, and then I'll do maybe Disney Dinosaur, because both of those, they had to have character, you know? Yeah. We had to see in a herd of dinosaurs that were all the same species, you had to go, oh, that's this guy, and that's this guy, and that's this guy. You had to pick them out right away, yeah. okay? Or else you lose your audience in the storytelling. Um, so it is, you're absolutely correct. It's, it's silhouette is the, the key thing. So when you have little lumpy bits or horns or growths on your, on your head, like many dinosaurs do, that, Dave, that is the go-to. Dave has those. Yes. And Dave has, <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> it's for display purposes. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the obvious place you go to are all these bumps. And so you, it's like if you could color the head in black and you could still recognize the shape of that animal, then you're on to something. So in Disney's Dinosaur, we had Iguanodons, which are clearly the most kind of, you know, no offense to Iguanodon workers, but the most boring of the dinosaurs. <laughs> but they can do a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. The, their heads are a shoebox. I'm talking their heads. They're a shoebox, right? Yeah. They're just these big rectangles. And when they were first doing the movie, the first thing I said to myself was, wow, this is great. As long as they don't pick Iguanodon for the main character, we're in a good place. So at that time, there were maybe like, you know, 600 species of dinosaurs, and that's the one they put. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so if you could color that head shape in black and still pick it out as to who is who, you're in, you're in a good spot. So by making, making one of them the bad guy, you know, triangles are an aggressive symbol or shape. So you would put a little kind of like a triangle on the top of the head. You turn that horn into a sharper triangle shape. The good guys are always a little more round, um, a softer shapes or square shapes, you know? So that's what we did with the main character, Aladar, was we kind of squared things off a little bit. And the females are, say with me now, they're ovals or they're circles, softer shapes. Friendlier. Yes. So her, <laughs> so her head, if you colored it in, was an egg shape. And I kind of used the same things for the Walking with Dinosaurs 3D movie. And it wasn't me going, all right, this is what I'm going to do. It worked before. You know, it's it, you do a lot of drawings and you send them in and, and people go, oh, I like this. I like this. I like this. 
but they always gravitate towards those same things. The, 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 the bad guy or the antagonist had more sharp shapes, more triangles in him. The good guy, uh, was a little, uh, um, uh, softer and the female was oval, you know? So it's just, <laughs> it's just kind of, it's just how our brains are, are trained. We imagine, when we imagine dinosaurs, we not only imagine them in the sort of grey plastic sort of standard, oh, it's a big animal, therefore it's great, but we also tend to associate them with colours yeah. that presumably animators are using. So, I mean, I know that red is seen as like danger, so you get more reds in predators and things like that, but it's, it's how characters are designed and how that affects the science and how we imagine them. Are you guilty of this, is what I'm saying? Have you ruined us? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I was going to say, the, the Carnotaurus was basically all red. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> like the whole, the whole animal. are always <laughs> red. <laughs> it is the truth. Because of the, the devil nature of them. You know? Well, let's see, um, you know, any colour on a T Rex and stuff, unless it's Jurassic Park where they do them in green, they often have red splotches on their faces yeah. or they. The red head trope on Tyrannosaurus yeah. might be me. <laughs> there was a discussion of this online the other day because the special I did with Chris Packham a few years ago now, when we did the colour design for that, and I did that with the artists Gabriel and Gerto. Yeah. Hey, I hope I'm saying Gabriel's name wrong. He and I have chatted many times, but I don't know how to say his surname. Um, we picked a kind of orangey red for the for the little horns over the eyes, in part to make it look different from a lot of other T-Rex designs. But since mm -hmm. then, there's been an absolute rash of them online, and we appear yeah. to be the origin of that tro <laughs> that trope. So, <laughs> redheaded T Rex. I am going to blame squarely on I, I think Doug Hen Douglas Henderson. Well, yeah. So his that was a Daspletosaurus, I think. Is that he a Tarbosaurus? Oh, it was a Tarbosaurus. I know the piece you mean. And when I saw that in in that book, uh, I think I forget the name. Is a Zerkus. Well, book, he did. But, he did but, loads. I, I mean, yeah. oh my god, I, I I had never seen that before, and it was shocking and so cool. And boy, did it stick, you know? Yeah. If something's cool, it sticks and it doesn't go away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But as to your note on, on colors in these character designs, here's an interesting... The reason silhouette is so important is because color is relative. Mm. So it depends on the light, the lighting mm. situation you're in, okay? If it's, if it's nighttime... You're not going to see that, that just because this animal is red, you don't, you're not going to see the red. You know what I mean? It's like, you can't say, okay, John is red, Bill is blue, and Lindsay is yellow. Okay. We're good. We don't need to change the design much. People are going to know they're accurate. The end of the story. No, you put them in a nighttime situation. You, you don't know who's who anymore. Yeah. You know, you, uh, you put them next to a, a blazing fire. You don't know who's new anymore. You know, it's like that scene in the abyss when he needs to cut the, the wire, yeah. the, 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 cut the green wire. It's, it's like that, you know, it's totally relative. Um, so silhouette is far more important thing. Colors the icing on the cake. I think what is more important, um, in discerning things is pattern oh. and contrast in pattern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. The, like a, a, a herd of zebra, right? A very strong contrast. You'll be, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a better example than zebras because to our eyes, we can't tell who's who. <laughs> but, You've just got but, to learn. So I, so I worked at London Zoo for a yeah. while and yeah, it took me quite a long time to learn the zebra. Yeah. But once you did, it was quite easy. Yeah. The, the one which took, which was harder actually was some of the other antelope where they mm. don't, I mean, at least with zebra, once <laughs> you go, Oh, that one's got a nick on the ear and that one's got a thicker stripe on its butt on the left side. And that one's got a really thin stripe in the middle on its face. Yeah. You can actually pick them apart really easily. But things yeah. like oryx, which are basically all white with a bit of brown. And we had seven of them yeah. and it took me ages to learn. But yeah. once you do, you, you just get that <laughs> very, oh, there, that one's horn curves slightly more. And that one's got a little bit more brown and that one's got slightly shorter legs. And mostly that's relative. And then the really hard bit is when you see them on their own and you can still tell them apart. Yeah. If you put four of them in a row, I can go, well, that's the taller one and that's the fatter one and that's the one with the weird leg. But when you just see it on its own, and that was the, always the amazing thing for me with keepers, with almost any animal when they've worked day in, day out with these things for years. Yeah. You know, they'll walk into an aviary with 50 different birds and they go, well, that's that one and that's that one and that's yeah. that one and that's... Yeah. What? 
Oh, we don't have that luxury in, in a 120 minute long movie, you know? Yeah. <laughs> we don't have that luxury. It's got to be like that. Moan, moan, moan. <laughs> and you can't give them accessories either, because that's a cheat in most cartoons. You can just give them a pair of glasses oh. or a bow in their hair or something like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. You can't do that with dinosaurs. Oh, no. Well, with, with, yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. well, with the walking with dinosaurs, so you have that there was that kind of thing going on. So these were the pachycephal, pachycephalosaurus, pachyrhinosaurus, so the cer- big ceratopsians that basically don't have horns but a giant kind of mm-hmm. nose boss. Yeah. But one of them has a hole in the frill. Yeah. Mm. That was my idea. <laughs> so yeah, but no, it's 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 a it's a clear piece of character design which makes them stick out. Though of course that's now become propagated, and oh now my you gosh. see. Pachyrhinosaurus toys with holes in the frill. Or the Sinoceratops from uh, Jurassic, uh, what are we on? Jurassic World now. Yeah. According to Tom Holt, yeah. that was originally a Pachyrhinosaurus that got changed late in the day. So it's a double propagation oh. where it's, they've incorrectly put holes in the frill because they think that that's normal, not that one individual, despite the fact that in your film there's a hundred of them and it's the only one with it. Yeah. And then they've changed the name of it, and now you can buy toys of Sinoceratops with holes in the frill. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. You know, and that'll, that'll keep going. That will propagate for years. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be dealing with that forever. <laughs> Um, I shouldn't have taken. I shouldn't have taken the blame for that. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> we'll edit that bit out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, your background? Are you? You're not a paleontologist by background. If you met not. your first paleontologist at Disney, so yeah. how do you go about researching your designs and your drawings? I mean, what are your what are your main go to things? What do you do first? You know, I do lots of things in movies. You know, these days my my bread and butter has been. Uh, the Marvel movies. So yeah, yeah, do storyboards on those movies, um, lots of other animation. But whenever I do get to do dinosaurs, it's an absolute joy. And, and, um, and it's, it's my chance to, you know, bust open the books like I did as a kid. You know, Mm. it's, it's, I'm just not going to go on Google and go, oh, there you go. Just do that. No one will care. No one will know. I try and do my best to make it as, use as much information as there is to, I don't know, number one, just to make a difference. Otherwise you're doing the same thing over. If if someone says, here, do a T-Rex and I go, oh, there's the Jurassic Park one. Let's do that again. It seemed to work and just call it a day. No, you want to show something different. You know, so I, I do, I bust open the, 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 the papers. Uh, um, I get in contact with, with paleontologists. They're always, you know, usually very helpful and willing to talk. Um, and, uh, so that's, that's where I start. And then I just start doodling. I do rough sketches and, you know. So it's the paleontologists who basically needle you and say, got to get that right, got to get that yeah, right, and then yeah. you can ignore them entirely and upset them. That's the best y- thing to do. Yes, but I started from a good place, right? I started from a good place too. So my conscience is clear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, but that, that's what I was going to bring up ages ago. So, you know, when, when David was talking about, like, character design in a character-driven movie, you know, you, you as a... You know, I, I try and watch films like that dispassionately because I, I want to be entertained, and that's kind of the point of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you know that, yeah, if you're going to have your animals talking and it's not going to look very weird when they've got beaks and fixed faces, you're going to end up with lips and expressions that we don't think they could do, or you're going to end up cheating proportions to make them look distinct or whatever. We, we know that. But I think what people often don't realize is that at least some of that stuff is still true, even for documentaries. Because even if there's a voiceover and a narrative or a narrator telling you what's going on, Mm -hmm. you want the action to be distinctive. You want those animals to be memorable because you want people to pay attention. And then on top of that, even me as a paleontologist, as a consultant, and even artists or creature designers or animators like David and other people getting involved in it, there will still be producers and directors going, I don't care, turn that up to 11. Yeah. I, I really don't think people people recognize that. I, I, I caught quite a bit of flack for some of the T-Rex design that I was involved in for stuff that I specifically told them, don't include that, it's nonsense. Mm-hmm. And they put it in because they wanted it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, they go, this is a hyper-accurate T-Rex, and D- Dr. Hone was responsible for this. Yeah. Oh, 
cars and yeah. did stuff that I told you not to, but yeah. the random producer doesn't get any emails about it from angry paleontology nerds. Yeah. I do. Yeah, it, it, it used to, and I mean, it really used to eat me up. I mean, there, it, it, you know, God bless the internet. There, there are still posts from me from 1997, you know, <laughs> of people criticizing the Disney movie. Oh, they're going to do this to it. And they're going to do this to it. And, you know, and, and, and I'm defending myself. I'm, you know, it, it really used to get to me. But now I think people know how movies are made. They, they, and you can, Watch any DVD, any anything online about every how decisions are made, and I think people are a lot yeah. more forgiving now. And also, you know, they can, they can check my public profile on on Facebook or whatever and see. Oh no, he he does know how to do real dinosaurs. <laughs> so you know. But yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Is that a lot of, a, in some ways, a lot of people are more forgiving, though obviously there are still enough, it's going to say, keyboard warriors who will, who will point out how, how dreadful all your decisions <sighs> are. But yeah, I, I think yeah. they often don't understand either, you know, how those things got done. So in, in the case of the, the one I did, so at least part of the problem was the fact that the, the, the show got commissioned in kind of March, April time for the following Christmas. So we had an 18, 20 month lead on the the show mm -hmm. and then they decided it was such a good idea they wanted it out this christmas mm. so we went from 20 months to eight months overnight and the animator studio was in canada so that's a six hour time difference to me yeah so in terms of communicating and getting things done on a daily basis yeah. they hit a problem mid-afternoon well i'm not going to see it until the next day um, and so curiously enough, we had some issues because you do the same amount of work in a third of the time. Not, not ideal. Well, you know, I, 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 I directed, uh, a show called, uh, it was Dinosaur Revolution. That's, and then it got turned into Dinotasia. And not only. Yeah. So, so, so again, for people who don't know, so there was a, was it six episodes? Eight? Uh, it was originally six. I think it got turned into four. Four at the end, I think. Yeah. yeah, but but they but they they got chunked together into this one documentary called Dino Tasia, which I saw in the cinema in the UK. So I, oh, I you were the guy. Had, oh, it had a release. <laughs> that was I, you. I, I, I was I was the audience member. Um, <laughs> Uh, but narrated by Werner Herzog, which Werner is magnificent. Oh, wow. Yeah, I got to direct Werner Herzog. That was, that was something. <laughs> yeah. Except he insisted on pronouncing it. I mean, I know I know he's he's German, but he insisted on pronouncing it Dinotasia. Yeah. Which was <laughs> really Not weird. There were, a couple, there were a couple takes of him where he was like, he was, uh, you know, he would... The sun is blood red in the sky, and the, you know, and he'd be going off, and then, and then you go, wait, I, I think that was too, too Werner for even me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And anyway, I was, I was gonna say, so I, 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 you know, I directed that, but on, on top of directing it, I, I designed a great deal of the characters on that. Um, storyboarded a lot of it. It was a tremendous task, and there were about, yeah five or six different studios involved. And like you said, what? one is in China, one is in Canada, one's in Australia. And my, my day was just like, yeah, it was, it just didn't end. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, if something went wrong, there was nobody to fix it, but me, you know, there were just oh, yeah. times where it's like, well, I have to put in another two hours to fix this because they're not going to get back to it. And it was, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. Tremendous amount of work, but a, uh, but a labor of love, and it, it turned out absolutely bizarre. But, <laughs> but I'm still very proud of it. You know, so. I, I I think you should be. Yeah, there, there's some there's there are some bits which are let's say odd. Yeah, but yeah, the the vast majority of it, it it looks really good and it plays really well. And and you know, paleontologists or, or real enthusiasts who know their stuff, you know, large chunks of the segments are based on real fossils. So like you you have that thing with the I think it's Mementosaurus, um, or one of the saurus pod says the tail bit not. Oh, Shunosaurus. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it gets Shunosaurus. Sorry, wrong, 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 wr
Wrong, wrong Chinese sauropod. Yeah. But yeah, it, I, but that's based on a specimen with this huge pathology in the tail, where it's quite possible that some of the end of the tail was bitten off. And yeah, yeah, that that's not covered in the narration, but it's it's there in the material if you know it. And I think that shows a a, a depth and a level well, which you you, re, you in fact you get the opposite in most documentaries where they just make stuff up to make it sound more exciting. Yeah, you're actually putting in detailed bits of research and then not discussing it and just letting it be there yeah it was also you know there's a lot of lot of pathologies i i think you know is is what we um kind of honed in on you know um because they told the story um and that originally the stories were all supposed to play without a line of narration and that and that's how we approached it it's like if you can strip the narration away and the story still works we're in a good place we all knew because it's happened over and over again narration would be added. I was going to say, if Blade Runner can't get away with it, you've got no Oh, um, It is the story of my career. I mean, <laughs> there are many shows that I've worked on for years that have not been made, but all of them started with, we're going to do something different. It's going to be just <laughs> dinosaurs being dinosaurs. And we're going to be so involved in their world and their characterization as real animals. And and I'm like rolling my eyes, going, like, "Oh, here we go again," you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you do what you can, and yeah, and, and then it's only a matter of time. It's like this one's called Barry. He's the funny one. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> and he'll be blue. Yeah, uh, yeah. We we had so so a, one one show I worked on as, as as again a documentary. We we were told that I think at one point there were five different consultants on it. Mm-hmm. So all all academics who worked in in this field, um, and we we were told that no, nothing would be done unless the majority agreed on it. And for the vast majority, you know, we were we all knew each other. We all had roughly the same. So there was it was only it was like you know five nil was the usual. Right. We, yeah, everyone says we should do this, or three people would say, "Yeah, it's a good idea," and two would go, "Well, we're not sure, but I, it's not really a problem." Kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, and yeah, they they wanted to have a a scene, let's say, of a specific behaviour. And I went, and for some reason, it came to me first. I think because I was the only one in the UK at the time, and it was a British production. And I went, "No, don't do that. Really, don't do that. It's absolute nonsense." We've been trying for years to get away from that and stop people thinking that that's normal part yeah. of their behaviour. You don't yeah. put it in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Next week. Um, so we're putting that scene in that we talked about. It's like, okay. So I got to the <laughs> point. I emailed every, I emailed everyone else and said, look, I've already told them twice now and they're doing it anyway. Yeah. And sent them an email. It's like signed by all five professionals going, don't do it. Yeah. I told you not to do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Strangely enough, it still made it in the final <laughs> show. <laughs> it's because you don't understand emotion. It's not about science. It's about emotion and engagement. You've got to inspire people with dinosaurs. But again, you know, there's all the name. There's all our names at the end, and everything was scientifically approved. Yeah, except the scene we told you not to do. Yeah. So basically, what we're doing in this podcast is basically having both of you go, guys, going, "It's not our fault," even well, though it is totally yeah. our fault. Yeah, this is yeah. <laughs> it's catharsis. Exactly. Well, to, to, to a to a degree, but I, I, yeah, I think as I say, there's kind of two different aspects of that. There's there's some things where it's entirely external. Yeah. And there are times where, like we say, you know, lips on an iguanodon because he has to talk, where it's entirely reasonable because otherwise it's just not going to work. Um, and I think people don't even recognize that there's two different problems there, let alone how you might end up with either of them. You know, these days it's, it's mostly storytelling I'm doing, uh, storyboarding and yeah. things. But when it is design stuff, like I say, I always try and go to the science because it's super interesting, even if it's an alien creature, like, you know, the, the creatures in John Carter or something, you know, mm. I always go to the science because it's just so much more cool stuff than, than mm. making it up. But there is always a balance between science and what is real and storytelling. And that's, that's always the line I, I have walked, you know, mm. what's interesting is when they start doing the, the, the interviews and things for books and, and TV shows and even though they almost completely ignored everything scientific you put in there, they want to hear about it, you know? And, yeah. and, and they like that sound bite. It's always good to know when you've enjoyed a film and you've watched something that you've also been educated and you can forgive yourself and it's not just been entertainment and popcorn, it's been educational and learning, you see. You know, you like to kid yourself that way as well. So having that extra bit of information afterwards helps quite a lot. Yeah. 
will will people take away the right message? I mean, I okay, I'm, I'm talking particularly young kids, but I've I've had six and seven year olds who want me to tell them more about Indominus Rex mm. from Jurassic World, <laughs> yeah, because it's their favourite dinosaur, and yeah. I go, but it but it's it's made up, it's a fictional. No, but tell me about it. Yeah, or I've been told it's real, and they know it's real because they saw it in the movie, right? And I'm I'm not having a go at Jurassic Park for that, but it's like that that's the problem we have when something which is obviously fiction and branded as fiction and even in that fiction they go this is a made up animal yeah some people walk out of that thinking it's real yeah guess you know the slightest error in a documentary will be propagated forever because of course people will remember it well there's something because that, that's the factual stuff yeah i mean there's something you get you know i i've wrestled with that as, as well and and <sighs> Sometimes, well, yeah, I'm resigned. You can't, can't do anything helps. about it, so I've given up. Yeah, <laughs> those people that, that's, can't that's be my take. Yeah, and they're not going to do any damage, you know. But, <laughs> but, but it's it's like so. For instance, the Indominus Rex. You know, in in the movie, it, it's able to change its color, right? I mean, and I'm yeah. sure you have gone well. But real animals can do that, you know, so, like the, the cuttlefish or whatever they use, you know. So you're you're planting a little seed of science in there, you know. You're yeah. you're. Uh, you know, you're, uh, so what I'm looking for, you're, you're doing your job as an educator. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I found it, you know, I was that kid in line kid. I was in my twenties already. And you know, the, the premiere of Jurassic Park in, in, in Hollywood, you know, I'm in line and I'm that guy going, uh, the Velociraptors are only really six feet long and they should be covered in feathers and their arms are actually held like, you know, that was me. I was that guy. I hate that guy. <laughs> I really, <laughs> I really do. So when, when I when I run into kids, I try not to turn them into that kid. You know, I I I, 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 I try and inspire them and let them know this is a fictional thing, but this is what the real thing is, and isn't that so much cooler? Cooler, yeah. I mean, that, that's the th that's the thing. I was I was following a discussion only yesterday online where people were arguing about this, like, should you correct children when they say things? And I'm like, yeah, I I think you sh I think you can, and you think you should. It, it depends, you know. If a three year old comes and goes, this is my favorite dinosaur ever, and it's T Rex, and he's he's holding a Triceratops, I'm gonna go, yeah, kid, knock yourself out. But it's um, <laughs> no, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But. What I think, and I think this is so true of so much scientific communication, you know, from arguing with people on Twitter through everything else is it's just a question of tone and just go, yeah, pterosaurs are very similar to dinosaurs, but did you know that actually they're really not? Isn't that interesting? Exactly. And they go, because oh, exactly. they've learned something. Yes. And I think yeah. the problem is when pe people assume now that as soon as you correct anyone, you're a, well, actually guy. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, but I, you can correct them without being a massive jerk. Jerk. <laughs> that, that's, that's really all it comes down to is you go, yeah, that's yeah. really cool. And you're nearly right. But yeah. Yeah. actually, and here's the dirt and then here's the reason and yeah. you can learn this. And isn't that cool? You've learned something. And yeah. I very rarely come across kids who are anything other than delighted to have been corrected and, you know, and immediately run off to tell someone else because they've just learned something. The giant scary man told uh, me yeah. off! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah, and the, the only kids who don't are the ones who are never wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I, yeah. I once, I once did a, I once did a kids event and this, this kid, he was about eight, I'd guess, and was just, the jaw was just going and just, just telling, he didn't want to ask. He, he didn't, I don't think he even necessarily wanted me to listen. He was just talking at me and it got to the point that the teachers just had to cut him off because every time I tried to say anything, he'd interrupt and just talk. And at yeah. the end of the session, I'm not kidding, like the whole class trooped out. And he was somewhere in the middle of the line. I went, no, thank you. And they all wave. And then his head appeared round the door, still talking, <laughs> with like, like a cartoon with his hands on the edge of the door <laughs> and was literally like pulled out of shot oh from off screen by one of the teachers, dragged away, still telling me something and explaining to me. And it's like, I, I'm not sure I was going to correct him. <laughs> I, I may be guilty of that. I'm not. I'm not joking. <laughs> it's it, and you know where it comes from. It's the exuberance of of actually talking to 
Oh, he was delighted, but yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't upset. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Port Stewart Sumida was like I said, the first paleontologist I met. And he 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 was on the Disney dinosaur movie as a consultant. I barraged him with <laughs> questions and everything I've ever wanted to know. You know. And I think I just stunned him. Like either it was somewhere between someone shut this kid up, or <laughs> I'll talk to him at another time. You know, get get us in a room together and we can talk. I have a job to do here. You know, so <laughs> the the thing is, I mean, for at least some of us, it's it's still not that much different. Like I, you know, I have like like uh, Matt Weddle is a you probably know Matt, don't you? Uh yeah, online he lives not far from me at all, but we've never. Yeah, I was going to say because yeah, because he's 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 just out he's just outside of L.A. So yeah. Matt and Matt and I are good friends and are collaborating a couple of things. Matt is a, like a hardcore sauropod guy. It's all yeah. sauropods all the time, and everything else isn't very interesting. And I Hot like console. my sauropods. I've just never really studied them in anything like the depth that I have theropods or ornithisians. Mm-hmm. And so when Matt and I get together, it's not dissimilar because I'm grilling him about all this sauropod stuff because he's this <laughs> absolute font of knowledge. And I I want to, you know, oh, but what about, and, and wasn't there that paper about the pneumaticity? And it'll tell me they've got weird feet. And didn't I read something about their armor last year? And yeah. So it's you're in good company because we do this to each other. <laughs> okay, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I have I have three children, and they're all you know they're all interested in in in, in dinosaurs, you know, as well. And they keep asking me, you know, all of these questions, things because Daddy knows, you know. Mm. So. <laughs> That's quite interesting because there's one group of kids that I've come across who are not very interested in dinosaurs, and those are the children of paleontologists. Yeah, I can see uh, that. And I, like I think because it's just so, it's just so embedded. They're so used to going to the museum and hanging around with all these bones and being dragged out into the desert, and they they <laughs> they, they, they're not like anti, but. I've I've never met a paleontologist's kid who's say you know six to thirteen who's been like oh yeah dinosaurs are cool it's like yeah whatever. it's like being a pastor's <laughs> kid yeah being a pastor's kid you know where that's going right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I don't think it's the teenage rebellion it's just the that the, they don't hold that fascination because they're not strange and weird and some special treat to go to the museum and all yeah. that as you say that that typical moment of standing under the skeleton because they've been doing that since they were in a cot yeah they're the sort of kids who get excited when they go oh did you hear about Dave's friend and he, he's an accountant yeah. <laughs> let's, go, let's go speak to a real accountant <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't spark the imagination, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to see um, some of David Crenshaw's work, um, he's actually um, big on Facebook. So if you go to facebook.com forward slash David Krentz, Krentz is spelt K-R-E-N-T-Z, art. So that's uh, Dave Krentz art, no spaces or anything like that. Facebook.com forward slash Dave Krentz art. You can see loads of his stuff and it is all pretty awesome. And the models are incredible and I kind of want one. I yeah. want one day. So the, the, so the one the one he's been putting up most recently is his new Jusheng Tyrannus, which is the Tyrannosaur I named. So of course I'm extremely excited to see a really cool model uh, done of it's my lovely. dinosaur. It's and, and And it's having a good old fight. And we see everybody sort of says oh yeah dinosaurs why do they always pick you know the things where they're always roaring but they could be yawning they could yeah. be quite sleepy as they're running along catching flies as my granddad always used to say <laughs> <laughs> or maybe belching we mm. actually we actually had a debate about whether they were belching or not because i i was mistaken i thought that pigeons couldn't burp i thought that that that's an urban myth according to the internet i was very upset anyway that's got nothing to do with things come on dave we've got to go home <laughs> We are both at home. It's locked yeah, down. I was going to say we're both at home and not going anywhere anytime soon. So, in the words of Ju Cheng Tyrannus. <sighs> oh, I was going for. Rawr. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast with Izzy Lawrence and Dr. Dave Hone. This episode was only made possible thanks to our patrons on Patreon and for listeners like you who share our content with your friends. So please spread the word on social media. You can find us on Patreon, Facebook, and at ISZI underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and at D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E on Twitter. 
include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. Ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk, email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. We are hoping to bring you so much more, but we can only do that if our audience continues to grow. So please like, share and subscribe.